Welcome to Security Architecture Podcast, where we help cybersecurity professionals to stay ahead of the curve and ensure they are successful in their cybersecurity journey. Okay. Hi, I'm Evgeny. I'm Dimitri. We have here Patrick from Zscaler. Patrick, can you please introduce yourself and tell us a bit more about Zscaler? Hi, everyone. My name is Patrick Foxhoven, and I've got uh, two titles at Zscaler. Um, I'm CIO for the company, but then my other day job is I look after our emerging technologies team, which is a team that has built some of our uh, products. I've been with uh, Zscaler from the beginning. We've been around for about 10 years now, and uh, very happy to meet you, too. Excellent. So, uh, Patrick, tell us uh, what is the name of the offering, addressing SAS? So that's the outbound browsing from Zscaler. Sure. So obviously, SASE is kind of a broad definition. But um, when when you when you take the parts of SASE that that we are uh, that we play in, um, the first product that we have is called Zscaler Internet Access, or uh, I may uh, use an acronym ZIA for short. But uh, and you can't stop our marketing team from putting Z in front of everything. So you'll see a naming scheme here on our products. But uh, Zscaler Internet Access is basically our outbound security gateway in the cloud that has uh, you know, evolved over time, started as a web proxy 10 years ago, and then over time has evolved that to, to meet, I think, the true definition of SASE, meaning it's not just web traffic anymore, it's all ports and protocols, it's uh, cloud sandboxing and, and advanced malware protection, it's data loss prevention, it's browser isolation, et cetera. So that's our outbound cloud gateway, so to say, that a user goes through on their way out to the internet. As you mentioned, SASE has a lot of different components. It could be the network part, the remote access part, the firewall the service part. Besides the ZIA, what other parts you guys also capture as products there? Yeah, so if I, if I actually, I, I talk about SASE a lot, and if you, Gartner has their future of network security is in the cloud uh, paper, and they actually have a pretty good definition of, uh, of SASE. Um, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll share that quote uh, here on my screen. Yeah, I, yeah. This is this is the the best. I'm I'm literally quoting Gartner. This is the best representation of uh, of SASE. I think that uh, that it, that is available. Hopefully, you can see that screen. Okay. It's mm -hmm. in my mind, SASE is all about finding one vendor, or what is really another way of saying one platform. Meaning, uh, SASE is not service chaining. It's not stitching together a bunch of point products. You want one you know, platform that's going to do obviously secure web gateway, uh, CASB capability, cloud access security brokering, uh, DNS security. They included zero trust network access, which is kind of the, the inverse of the outbound gateway and browser isolation. So that's, I think that's usually the best quote that I, that I found to, to reference what SASE is um, from, from Gartner. Great. Um, and I know you have also products that answer ZTNA and some other things that we're probably going to capture on different episodes. We do have episode two in our series where we talk about what SASE is, isn't, and our view on this. Mm -hmm. Great. How would you describe the maturity of Zscaler product in outbound browsing? Yeah, so we've been, It's. I would say it's extremely mature. We've been playing as a... Uh, as a pure play born in the cloud, you know, security delivered as a service offering from the beginning for 10 years now, which not many companies I think can claim to have that level of maturity. We've never, uh, you know, SASE is all about consuming these kinds of services in the cloud as a utility. And we've never provided our service in the form of a single tenant box or appliance that a customer would run or a piece of software that they put in their environment. Uh, we've only ever delivered our service as a cloud. And so I think we're, we're pretty we're pretty bullish to say that you know we, we've been doing this the longest uh, from a maturity of you know we've been delivering this as a service for ten years now. We're not a, we're not an organization that's trying to take again a single tenant appliance version of how you used to deliver this service and virtualize it, put it as a VM and host it in a cloud, and then call that SASE. We we've only ever delivered this as a as a cloud service from the beginning, so extremely mature. And you've seen. Uh, what we've done over the last decade, you've seen uh, the evolution of our platform where, like I mentioned before, we started as a secure web gateway and just was handling web traffic. 
and then over the years added the ability to take all ports and protocols and then deepen the security capability with DLP and browser isolation and sandboxing and things like that. So we've evolved this platform over the last uh, 10 years. And um, it's, I think that's, that's why we've been, uh, if you talked about Gartner SASE term, uh, you know, one of the, where SASE started the secure web gateway with the magic quadrant, we've been the furthest right for the last nine years running, meaning the most visionary. And last year we just got to the furthest to the top too. So it's, I think, I think we're getting pretty good recognition around, uh, you know, how mature the platform is. Excellent. So this is uh, this brings us to you know to the next question, which is around the licensing of your product, and uh, we would like uh, to understand high level how would you license it? Is it based on seats, devices, concurrent connections, bandwidth? Yeah. So we we wanted to try to make it as simple as as possible to you know to consume as a customer. That's that's one of the advantages of any as a service offering or cloud capability. So it's quite literally priced as a uh, per seat. So it's a price per user per month annualized. And uh, that price will vary depending on, you know, we have different bundles or you can do a la carte service offerings. You can buy, you know, uh, an, an enterprise license that has everything that we do from an outbound security perspective, or you can buy, you know, a point license that's just, you know, one piece of functionality. So the price will vary. Uh, but we, we didn't want to get into the world of having to, you know, count how many devices a user has or even try to estimate things like concurrency or think peak usage or things like that. It's just a fee per user per month annualized. And uh, we assume inherently that users will have multiple devices. I mean, I, if I look, last I looked at my profile, I think I have 11 devices that are actively syncing through our service. So, you know, we assume a user is going to have a phone, tablet, PC, et cetera. Interesting. How about bring your own device? Is that also supported? It is. It's up to the customer to determine, you know, what policies they want to have in play. You know, in, in, if, I, if I put my other hat on our C, as a CIO, you know, in our company, how do we protect some of our, you know, critical data um, on a BYOD device? What we do is we basically have a policy that says when a user is logging into a critical service like Salesforce or, you know, file sharing service or whatever, um, we, th those services are configured to point identity to Zscaler. Zscaler transparently sees if they're going through our cloud or not. And if they are, allows them in. If they're not, rejects it there uh, as kind of just a transparent authentication hop. And so that's a very strong way, I think, to help with some of the BYOD challenges where we basically say, if you want to access corporate data with your, with your own device, you have to install our app so that you're going through our service. And if you don't, you just can't get to the data. It's, that's, it's, it's as simple as that. And that's how we've, you know, we're a big BYOD shop internally. Um, and uh, that's, that's how we've been able to, Kind of had a light-handed touch to making sure that it's being secure, but um, you know, not not so draconian where you can't access the data at all. Makes a lot of sense. So what we learn from that is that in order to access the, these assets, we always will have to go through the Zscaler app on any device. Yeah. Yeah. So it's kind of a way to transparently protect your data that are the things that people are accessing that's business critical. Uh, without, again, being really uh, really that painful for the end user. Great. So we are a podcast about architecture. So we want to dive into the architecture. Sure. Can you maybe share your screen and tell us about the global architecture, about the data centers, how you guys scale, how you guys help be faster, and yeah. walk us through what was in your mind when you guys were building the architecture to support this global initiative? Yeah, I'd be happy to. And I'll... Um, I'll do that in kind of two ways. So I'll, I'll start with some diagrams. Uh, mm -hmm. So some diagrams that I'll walk through a couple of builds just to kind of tell the story to illustrate it. And then I'm happy to break, I'm, I'm happy to break out of PowerPoint anytime uh, that I get a chance to, and uh, I can give you some live views or demos of what some of the, how well, later on feels. we'll, we'll d dive into more specific questions about secure web gateway, but for now, let's just start from high level architecture and dive in. Yeah, sure. So let me, let me walk you through a little bit of the journey and, and, what I think it takes to deliver SASE correctly. Um, so we knew when we were starting from the very beginning that um, to, to, to do a service like this in the cloud uh, at a, in, a, in a way that you're not slowing users down and you're not introducing choke points or bottlenecks is you have to be you know, as massively distributed at the edge as you can be. 
Uh, you know, another way of saying that is no one can go faster than the speed of light. So that means we have to be as physically close to the end user that we're serving uh, as they go out to the internet. You don't want, you know, I'm sitting here in the San Francisco area today. Uh, I forgot what this feels like to, to get on an airplane to travel anymore. But so let's say uh, I got on an airplane and I traveled to London. You don't want a user that's in London all of a sudden now to have to backhaul back through San Francisco or even even the East Coast, you, you want to you want to be as physically close to the end user as you can. So, what, what that means is you want to be as close from a latency perspective as you can. You want to be less than fifty milliseconds usually to wherever the user is. And so, the way the internet is architected today, I think the the right number of sites that you need to do that is probably a little over a hundred. We think now it's a little. It, we're at about one hundred and fifty data centers. That's what in my mind is one of the, the prerequisites to even start talking about being a true SASE player because it's the, the, the E word is edge. I mean, it's a services edge. It's you have to have a massive network at the edge and the edge has to do, you know, a hundred percent of your inspection capabilities. Otherwise, if the edge is just backhauling you to a more centralized region, it's just a little bit better, but it's, it's accentuating the same problem around. No one is going to go faster than the speed of light. You're going to, even if you're, you have an edge site at one location, you're backhauling 300 miles to another site where you actually have compute to do the inspection, uh, that's going to be not an ideal end user experience. It's going to break localization. It's going to not be great from a latency perspective. To do this service right, you've got to be massively distributed at the edge. and You have to be, in essence, just a transparent hop or two on the user's way to the internet wherever they're going. And so that's why when you look at our architecture, you know, we knew from the beginning we had to be massively distributed at the edge. Um, that's the map I'm showing here. We're at over 150 sites at the edge. Uh, and you don't, again, do things like service chaining or backhauling when you're introducing more and more capability. Everything that you run has to happen at the edge uh, that is real time. Naturally, there's certain things that by definition are not real time, like sandboxing. If you're going to download a, a file that a user is downloading and detonate it in a VM and watch it for two minutes, that doesn't need to be done at the edge. Uh, but if you're inline inspecting SSL traffic or, uh, you know, applying malware scanning or applying bandwidth optimization or throttling or shaping or all those things that, that are real time and very latency sensitive, they have to happen at the edge. And so when we started building this architecture, let me advance to the next diagram. Um, we, we, we said we had to come up with an architecture that would accommodate that, uh, meaning be massively distributed at the edge. But then there's certain parts of the service that you don't want to be as distributed at the edge. And so we, we kind of had a, we, we had the luxury of doing a clean slate architecture where we basically said, we're going to come up with three planes to our architecture and then we're going to build them ourselves. And you don't have the luxury of building an architecture like this. Again, if you're trying to retrofit a single tenant appliance version of your service and create a VM of that and call that a cloud. You, you have to, we went, we went so clean slate that quite literally we, we went so low level. We designed the TCP IP stack from scratch. We wrote our own TCP stack and built multi-tenancy in at that level. And so when you go that low level and then you build everything else out, you have an architecture, I think that looks a lot like this. And so there's kind of three planes to our architecture, the top plane here, which is what we call the control plane. This is where customers define policy and, and, uh, you know, configure how we're going to authenticate their users and what they want to have happen. And then, and so that's somewhat centralized, you know, that needs to be within regions, you know, within major theaters, US, EMEA, APAC, uh, but it doesn't need to be massively distributed at the edge. Then you have the middle piece, which is what we call the enforcement plane. And this is uh, those 150 sites. This is the inline piece of, of how we do what we do, which is Basically, you know, another way of saying the proxies are the things that are in line, you know, brokering or proxying traffic, massively distributed at the edge. They get their policy from the control plane, uh, but they need to get that and be able to operate with, you know, cached policy and update when things change. And, and you, you know, we had to build real-time protocols to make that happen. And then last but not least, the bottom piece is the logging plane. You want to aggregate your logs back to, uh, you know, particular regions or theaters. Uh, and that is a a big reason why is because you, you don't want as a customer when they start adopting a service like ours, they don't want the, the liability of worrying about their data being potentially sharded or stored in 150 sites around the world. You know, they, they want to make sure that it's more aggregated back. And so we, when we 
come in line to the traffic and the enforcement plane. We never touch the drive with any piece of customer data. We don't cache. It would only benefit us and we don't want the liability of that. We never write logs to local disks. They, they basically stream the logs in real time back to the logging plane. And by the way, the logging plane can be, we can guarantee if you're a customer in the US, we'll store your logs in the US. We can guarantee if you're in the EU, we'll store it in the EU. If you're a, you know, a, a large financial institution, let's say one of the largest Swiss financial institutions in the world is a customer of ours, we can guarantee the, the logs are stored in the borders of Switzerland. Uh, or we can even store it in private logging clusters on-prem if there's data sovereignty, privacy requirements, if it's a, you know, a, let's say a government use case. And so then what happens is when a user is roaming through this infrastructure, there's no marriage of a user to a data center or to even a, a you know, stack of VMs or services. It's a multi-tenant designed from the scratch architecture. So if the user's here in New York today, they're going to get their policy delivered on demand. And, uh, you know, 100% of their inline traffic will stay in New York, never service chained. And then if they, you know, travel to London tomorrow, um, the policy will migrate, will follow that user wherever they go. Uh, but ultimately, it's a, it's a transparent experience to the end user where they basically roam throughout these 150 sites anytime, anywhere around the world. And again, because we built it to be multi-tenant from scratch, there's no marriage of infrastructure to tenants, so to say. Uh, that's a very different architecture than I think a lot of other approaches in the industry where they're trying to not do the hard work and they're doing this with VMs. They're, they're, they literally provision a VM for a tenant in every site that they want to have service in. And then they'll try to do some kind of loose orchestration to keep these VMs in sync. And that's a, that's a totally different model than designing this from scratch. So Patrick, going so every tenant going to have their, well, sorry, is every customer has their own tenant, like a mini VM? How do you well, so in our architecture, there is no, we, there's actually no virtualization at all. Um, these are purpose-built uh, machines. They're commodity Intel x86 machines, not unlike a Google or a Facebook that's all running, so it's, you know, commodity hardware. It's all of our intelligence is done in software. So when we provision a tenant on our cloud, they get configured at the control plane. Hey, this is a new tenant. This is customer X. And automatically, they're able to roam because it's multi-tenant throughout the entire enforcement plane, all 150 sites, if that makes sense. There's no standing up resources for any tenant at the you know, enforcement level. So if I, if I recall, what you mentioned is that you are doing your multi-tenancy multi at the protocol level. That's We're, what you're doing. We wrote the that, TCP That's the differentiation. Yeah, we, it, I'm using that as kind of an extreme engineering example to, to show how low level, how purpose built the architecture uh, has been. We started so at the TCP ever, stack level and then built out. Yeah. So if I, if I were looking at TCP stream that's coming through your service, I would be able to identify always who is the tenant that it belongs to. Absolutely. That yeah. level, amazing. Yeah. Just to kind of my architecture level kicks, uh, kicks, kicks in. If I type what's my IP, I'm going to see mm -hmm. the IPs that are belong to Zscaler, correct, externally, I'm guessing. You do. You do. Okay. So and as, I, mm -hmm. sorry, keep on. So every customer or every, I don't know, there's going to be like a bunch of IPs based on London data center, New York data center. This depends from where I'm coming. This is my source IP going to be, I'm guessing. It is. It's going to be, you know, we, we publish a pool of hundreds of thousands of IPs if you want to map that out. Um, we, we do publish that transparently, uh, but it is going to be, and I think that's part of the security of our solution uh, is, you know, from the user as they go out to the internet and they're, they're getting their traffic scrubbed, there's nothing identifying that company or that, that end user. That's a benefit of our service, I think, from a security perspective. It minimizes the attack surface as the user is going out to the internet. Now that can break, you know, there's lots of, lots of organizations that have legacy notions like um, you know, they're going to a website that is filtered based on source IP. Um, so we do have the ability for a customer to extend the enforcement plane, the middle piece, into, into their environment in the form of a VM or what we call a connector. And they can configure policies that says when a user is going to this destination, uh, we want it to come out that VM on-prem and in their own data center or in an AWS VPC. Yeah. I would just want their to, to, to ask then. this. Because some, I don't know if it's legacy, but in the legacy firewalling, let's call it as, people yeah. sometimes used to configure access, especially business to business, based yeah. on the firewall external IP. It's probably yeah. going to be more question. Okay, makes sense. Yeah, I, I lost this bet uh, 10 years ago. I thought that you know, today we would never have that because 
source IP based security is not that strong. And obviously we've seen anything from spoofing to route hijacking uh, illustrate that. Uh, so I didn't think it'd still be the case today, but it very much is still the case quite often. So that's why we productize uh, this feature that we call source IP anchoring that, that allows a customer to still work with a cloud service like this uh, using, using their own IPs, so to say, but without sacrificing security. It's not a, when they do that, the, 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 the connector that they run in their environment is not an appliance. It, it, it's not listening to anything. It's managed and part of our cloud. The only reason why it runs there is to basically take on the customer source IP. Well, how do you tie back the user identity and MFA to your system, right? As an example, you know, what would be the best practice for different job roles in the organization? You know, a administrative worker need one type of access, uh, right? Uh, and the developer need a different type of access. How would you do that? Yeah, so when a user comes to us, um, we're, we're not an open proxy. Uh, we'd be kicked off the internet long ago if we were just a <laughs> to totally open proxy. So we always authenticate when a user comes to us. Uh, we do that by tying into the customer's existing identity environment. So that's that's done most commonly with SAML. So we'll talk uh, SAML to if the customer has Azure AD or Active Directory or Ping or Octas of the world, um, we'll, we'll, we'll talk SAML to them. And that's how we're doing user authentication. And um, you know, if we want to consume group policies, so that you know, often you know, in a large organization, they're not doing policies at the per user level; they're doing it at groups. Uh, customers also define locations as a part of your policy. So you say, you know, this is my this is my London office, and I'm going to define that by source IP address ranges, or define it by tunnels. So we can take tunnels from devices, routers, firewalls that they have on their prem. And obviously the tunnels then have authentication as a part of that. And you can define your policies um, at, at any level of granularity. You can, you can create a tunnel at your office and say, send the default route to Zscaler. And then uh, within that tunnel, you can define all your individual subnet masks or ranges and say 10.0 slash eight is my guest network. Don't authenticate, let it go out because it's coming through the tunnel. It's, it's still getting authenticated through us. So there's a, there's a really flexible policy engine that allows you to then determine how you want to do it. But the short answer to your question is we will talk SAML and uh, authenticate the users via SAML. Makes sense. So do you have any anomaly detection tied to this capability? Like, you know, some user that was usually connecting from London and now he's connecting from Taiwan. Yeah. So there's lots of, lots of that capability in, in, in what we do. That, that's a perfect one example of many. Um, the, so we have reporting analytics uh, alerting that come into play inherently in our service. And then we realized that a lot of customers would want to use that, but not have data, not have that kind of visibility siloed just with us. They want to maybe want to take the visibility that we have and correlate it with other infrastructure that they, you know, are logging or have management of like endpoint device logs, um, other things like that. So we actually have a productized offering that allows even the logs to stream out of our service in real time back to the customer's environment on-prem. That's what we're depicting here on the bottom right of this diagram, what we call nanolog streaming, where you can uh, you, you can choose to take the full fire hose, all logs all the time, and stream it out into your SIM, into Splunk or ArcSight or Curator or whoever. Uh, or you can choose to say, just send certain levels of events. And you know most mature deployments will have multiple streams going to different places as well. And that, that can then even add the anomaly detection and you know security insight that we have and even correlate it with everything else that they may have, like say an EDR endpoint agent um, on the device with server log files or other things that they are aggregating. But to get that, I will need the, some type of third party solutions such as SIEM and my own logic to be able to catch that anomaly, right? You would provide the raw data and I'll have to analyze it. That's if you want to correlate it. You can you can skip that option and just take advantage of the anomaly detection and alerting that we have inherently in what we do. The way the way we handle things like that is we basically are calculating a user risk score, a zero to one hundred number, and that score will go up the more risky the user is, and will go down the less risky. And you can tie your policies and get alerting and even report on that, trend that over time. We aggregate user risk scores up to company level risk and. Uh, I'm happy to show some of that if you'd like to see what that looks like. But uh, I mean, we have, we have, you don't have to bring in a third party. That would only come if you want to correlate it with other things. 
Yeah, we're happy to see that. Okay, so let me uh, let me let me pivot out of uh, slides, and I never like to do uh, canned demos. So this is our this is live production cloud. I'm logged in as uh, the CIO of Zscaler, so you're, you'll see um, actual uh, live data from from Zscaler's perspective. So to illustrate the point I was just referring to, um, under under our uh, analytics. We have, I'll start at the macro level, we, we have company-wide risk score. And the company-wide risk score is showing that, again, that number that we're calculating, zero being good, 100 being bad, and aggregating across all of our users, uh, all of Zscaler users, uh, based on their activity, meaning do we see malicious activity coming from them? Do we see them browsing suspicious destinations? Do we see the machine actually compromised with command and control and it's phoning home through us. All these different data points come into a, a score at the per user level and then aggregate up into the company level. Now, don't be alarmed. This is a pretty high score. This is because we have our security threat researchers going through our service and always testing testing the efficacy. So you'll see that. I'll, I'll scroll down and show you the user so level risks. you can risks. stop a user and you configure dynamic post that says if your score is higher than XYZ, block the user, alert the admin. Yep. Or do. Yep. Or reduce his uh, access. Yep. Yeah. So it starts to get into more conditional access like capabilities then where, um, you know, depending on how safe you are, you're, you're tying access policies around that. Absolutely. Um, so here's our company risk score over time the last 30, uh, last 30 days. I can do different time frames if I want. I'm wondering what um, is the normal score you see for the, for the companies or average or what do you say it's normal? Well, so it actually varies based on the industry and also then the individual company's tolerance for risk. So, you know, if it's a, I'm not trying to, to, to take an easy answer, but let's say it's, it's one of our federal customers. So we're US FedRAMP certified and we've got federal agencies going through us. You know, there's, there's pockets of users where it, the, the risk score will be zero because they're not, they're not even doing general internet browsing. They're, they're in air gapped offline networks. So they're, you know, they're doing very little and then you'll have, you know, um, a, a Bay Area tech company that the risk score will be 70 or what we're showing here because, you know, we don't, we don't really filter anything. So it depends. The way we've tried to help customers grasp that is you'll see here that um, we've got distribution graphs of what user risks are the most risky users. In this case, everyone's working from road warriors from, from home. We don't have any of our corporate offices because no one's in the office. But then we also allow you to compare across your industry. So 1% of peer organizations. So you'll see that we're in the technology <laughs> vertical. So we've got a very high risk, like I was saying. Uh, that's, that's, that's not, this is not something you want to be overachieving in. But this is, again, these are all security researchers getting you know, 100 as their risk score because they're using our, um, doing malware research. And then we, so we allow you to compare in your vertical and then across all of our cloud as well. And again, you can go down to the user level here. Like I'm literally picking on a particular security researcher. Awesome. And this is all natively created just by using the service. There's no third parties. This is, and this is just one view of many. Obviously, we can we can drill into um, out of the gate. I mean, we've got dashboards that show all the different views of our service. How would you scale okay. for customers' demand? I'm sure that you experienced it recently with COVID-19 and everyone moving to work from home. Uh, so we'll be happy to hear yeah. a few words. And uh, you know, if, if you also can cover if you would uh, use public cloud infrastructure for scaling, such as GCP, Azure, AWS? Yeah, yeah, so um, prob probably two parts to the question. Let me, uh, I'll cover the, just how we scale in general first and then, uh, and then pivot into um, the, the IaaS public cloud part of that question. So um, the, the secret that not many people know is what, what, what does the name Zscaler mean? You can tell that an engineer named the company. It, it stands for Zenith of Scalability. That's, that's what uh, Zscaler actually was, uh, was, was founded on. We knew that scale was going to be probably the biggest challenge to solve um, in, in delivering a service like this. Um, and by scale, I mean, you know, true internet scale, meaning... Uh, we, when we when we deploy, you know, a company with 300,000 employees or, you know, a small company in one location with 10 employees, uh, we end up taking all of their traffic that goes to the Internet 
and often not just when they're at the office, but when they go home, we, we, we're, we're even more pervasive than a traditional ISP would be at a particular site is we're handling all that traffic all the time across all their devices. And so scale was the biggest challenge we knew we were going to have to solve. Um, to give you kind of a, a, a data point, we, we process a little over 100 billion internet transactions a day through our infrastructure which we think is uh, pretty unprecedented. We think it's definitely the largest security as a service offering. To com compare that, there's, that's, that's a little, little um, more than 10 times there are Google searches done in a day. Um, and that's... Interesting. Sorry, go ahead. When you, when you mention transaction, what do you mean? Because you know, if, if I'm browsing the website, there, will, there is multiple asks, so there is a lot of gets, yeah. a lot of posts happening. So do, yeah. do you consider like get and post this transaction or you consider like loading your website and make, making an operation on the website with the context awareness this transaction? So the short answer is, when, let's say you load a website and there's 10, 10 transactions within it, fetching an image, doing different, fetching JavaScript, et cetera. Those would be 10 transactions in, in our metric. Uh, because every single transaction that goes through us, we log and we, uh, you know, analyze from a security perspective and choose, uh, you know, what, what level of inspection to do. So if it's a, you know, if a customer has cloud sandboxing and it's a PDF being downloaded, obviously that's, uh, that's a transaction we're going to send through sandboxing is one example of many. Um, but uh, yeah, that's, that, that's why, and it, the, the transaction count has kind of scaled in a, in a crazy way. Um, We've been we've we've been ahead of Moore's law. We've been uh, uh, doubling more than uh, than than every uh, eighteen Strong months. Strong statement. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, in fact, I'll I'll share I'll, I'll actually share the I'll, I'll share the graph because we, uh, uh, we we like to geek out about this stuff, uh, and it also obviously is important when you're when you're planning uh, uh, capacity uh, capacity planning. But uh, yeah, we're we're more than doubling every eighteen months that transaction count. So. Um, you know, if we were talking less than two years ago, we'd be at 50 billion. Uh, if you think about just the, the raw data of every transaction could be potentially, you know, one to two kilobytes of file size. I mean, we're, we're talking crazy amounts of petabytes. We had to, we had to figure out how to massively scale our logging infrastructure, how to massively scale, you know, machines in line processing traffic. Uh, the, the, that's why we had to go so low level, like I was mentioning, writing TCP stacks from scratch because we needed to have that level of optimization to handle it. And there's like crazy events. We've got crazy statistics. Like when you see, if you look at uh, how people were working uh, and it, all of a sudden everyone started working from home, the traffic patterns just went crazy because it was concentrations from, you know, corporate offices to now distributed around the whole world. And, you know, you have, you have events like the explosion of Zoom. Uh, if you look at, uh, you know, web conferencing traffic, um, Zoom exploding as, uh, you know, as a result of COVID to uh, one of the, one of the metrics that we, we've been sharing our, our private access offering because everyone started working from home. We saw a 10x increase in literally one business day when the world went on lockdown uh, in, in, uh, in different regions. Uh, so it's, yeah, we've, we've, I think we've very much been delivering on the vision of the company, Zenith, the scalability. Uh, and again, you had to be a purpose-built architecture. If we were trying to, to pivot to kind of your second question, if we were trying to build a, um, an infrastructure like this just in AWS or just in GCP or just in Azure, uh, we, would be, we wouldn't make money, to be honest, because uh, the, the, when, you're, when you're processing this amount of volume, you know, we're, we're, we're some of the, we end up becoming some of the largest consumers of even transit internet in particular countries or regions. And uh, that just uh, is not an, a model that makes sense in the, in the cloud providers. We do use them selectively. So we do use AWS and Azure and GCP and in places like China, you know, Alibaba for, you know, scale reasons, or especially instantaneous scale, like when things like COVID happens. Uh, but, uh, you know, we do have 150 sites that are our own. And we do think that, um, I'll share one more diagram with you that's architectural, but I think this is near and dear to my heart. We do think when you're delivering, especially in the context of SASE, when you're delivering a service edge, uh, you have to have sites that are your own because even the AWSs, Googles, and Azures of the world, they don't allow you to run compute at the edge. Um, you know, Google has 30 some sites that is where you run VMs. They have 100 and some plus sites at the edge. But those edge sites just backhaul to where you run the compute. And if you can't run compute at the edge at that massively distributed way, 
then what you end up having is this is this is the model on the left is what we end up looking like. So users, devices, locations, as they go, let's say in this example, they're going to Office 365. That's the number one destination of traffic that comes through our cloud um, for natural reasons. What ends up happening is they come through one of our edge sites. We're likely directly peered with Microsoft in one of those 150 sites and it takes one hop to Microsoft and is off on its way. If we built out our SASE architecture, let's say hosted on an IaaS provider and you know, running a VM, what that would literally look like, and this is, this is real, you can't, I, I don't think anyone's ever uh, refuted this, you, you basically have their front doors or edge sites and they backhaul to more centralized regions that run VMs. Um, just a year ago, Google only had 20 of those. What ends up happening is the traffic comes to the edge, goes back to where the VM or the compute is running to run the service, pops back out to the edge, then to you know, peer to Microsoft and then go to 365. There's a very different architectural approach on the right versus what we've done on the left. We don't, there's, 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 it's more than just us doing the left, but there's not very many um, because a lot of people think they can fast track to this space by just virtualizing, creating a VM and deploying them. Google has, you know, half the internet or whatever, but it's not really true as you start, you know, peeling the layers of what that architecture actually looks like. Let's uh, yeah. dive a bit, a bit uh, lower on a stack. And we mentioned a bit users and offices. Describe, please, how would a customer connect to Zscaler Cloud from their office? What's the options? Yeah. So there's, there's two fundamental ways people connect to us or, or use our service. There is we provide a software agent that runs on Windows, Mac, iOS, Android devices. It's in all the app stores. We call it the Zscaler app. There's the Z in front of everything again. And uh, the Zscaler app is um, not doing anything on the device. It's not, it's not trying to do any inspection on the device. It's basically just configuring or instrumenting the device to always go through Zscaler when need be and to authenticate. That's, that's all it really does. All of our services are done in the cloud. It's just a, a lightweight way to get, have the device forward traffic to us. Uh, so they can deploy the, the app on the endpoints and that's it. Or uh, they'll often also deploy when it's a, you know, a fixed location, you know, a, a, a branch or a headquarters or a campus where they own or control the network, they'll create tunnels at the edge of that network to us. So that's from a traditional router or an SD-WAN device, or uh, it could even be a firewall creating an IPsec VPN. The two tunnels we commonly will, will see is... Uh, GRE tunnels from networking devices or IPsec from security devices. Is this killer has a uh, preference of GRE or IPsec? We don't, other than the fact that GRE will often on their side be a lighter weight, uh, more scalable option because IPsec adds, you know, crypto overhead and often performance for IPsec on a box on their There's side. There's also is bandwidth uh, limitation a bit. Like I cannot run like a five gig on GRE or an IPsec. So what would you do if there is a requirement for two gig from an office? Would you have multiple tunnels? Yeah, so you can do multiple tunnels and, um, and load share among them. Or if it's like a, a really high volume site, you know, for example, the state of North Carolina, all K through 12 students go through Zscaler. That's 1.2 million students. Uh, that's hundreds of gigabits of traffic. You don't even want to necessarily mess with tunneling that we can extend our inspection plane into their environment in the form of either um, the physical boxes, the same physical boxes we would deploy in our data centers, or if it's smaller deployments, VMs that they can run. And that, that can help alleviate the need to even tunnel it then, if that makes sense. Interesting. You mentioned SD-WAN. Uh, I guess the limitation with the traditional network devices is if you build two tunnels for a primary secondary location, if the primary tunnel goes down, there's really no automated way to flip to the second tunnel. It has to be done manually. Uh, with with SD WAN, there's probably more flexibility because it's software controlled. Yeah, SD SD WAN's modernized that, um, and actually we have open APIs that all the SD WAN players have consumed that make that be really easy to turn up and then automate or orchestrate failover. Even the legacy routers, um, what we end up doing is we provide best practice. Um, Configuration, depending on the vendor, they call it something different. Cisco calls it IPSLA probes. Juniper calls it RPM probes. We basically give you the ability to monitor the tunnels and do auto failover um, on the device if, if, 
it does go down. So even legacy devices, we can we can get a little bit more um, modern in terms of doing failover and fault tolerance. Yeah, I think uh, the ability to provision our API for sd and have connectivity is very important for all the providers to succeed yeah. in large-scale deployments. Yeah, I do too. Great. Uh, if there is any other way for, before we go there, uh, you mentioned the Z app. So I can install mm -hmm. the Z app on multiple devices. Yes. Can a user just say, I'm fed enough and disable the app? Well, so that's up to the customer's configuration. You can give the users the option to turn it off, or you can password protect it where they have to have a one-time password that IT gives them to turn it off, or you can make it completely hidden where they, they may not even need to see anything to, to be able to interact with. So it, it depends on the company's use case on, on how they want to uh, configure that. Okay. And we spoke about all ports potentially. Is the Z app, I'm guessing the tunnel will take all ports and protocols. With the Z app, do I do only 443, port 80, DNS, or what's, the, what's my options? And what's people usually yeah. choose? So this was an area of recent enhancement. Uh, ZApp used to take just web, uh, but we, we added the ability to take all ports and protocols through ZApp now. Uh, it's, it's actually always taken it for ZPA bound flows for five years. We added it to uh, ZIA bound flows now as well, because we, we naturally over time added a, a cloud firewall in our internet access offering. So, you absolutely want to be able to take all ports and protocols then. Is this came, I'm guessing, because user user requests or, or yeah. natural progression? Okay. Yeah. Well, actually, to be honest, kind of both. It was, you know, a very common user request because they want you want the exact same level for the users wherever they go, not just when they're on the corporate office, getting all ports protocols when they go home, still getting the same protection. Um, so that, that's a natural ask, but it's it, it was also the inevitable. We, we always had planned to uh, to do that. If you've kind of seen how we've gone to market, you know, we tackled web first and then added more capability because doing a web proxy at scale is the hardest problem there. Adding all the other traffic is is actually not, not wasn't as hard. Of Would a you do a host checker to check if the uh, endpoint device has an antivirus part of the domain, has a certificate, and if not, maybe you're not allowed to, to, to browse the internet? Yeah, so our, our Z app uh, does have the ability to do endpoint checks, what we call posture checks. Mm -hmm. And um, it's more commonly done on our ZPA offering than ZIA, but uh, your policies then can be consumed based on criteria of the posture. Is the machine on the domain? Is it, uh, does it have um, a, a certificate on it? Our government customers love to say, is, does it have a CAC card or you know, a smart card inserted into it? And you, you, you allow more or less access dependent on uh, you know, those criteria, absolutely. Is there any other way to consume your product besides the Zap, uh, Z app on, on network, maybe over OEM, or you play, or you have a ISP partnership? So, yes, the short answer is yes. Um, we, we do have some of our service provider partners that will take what we do and white label it or integrate it at the network level and then sell it as a, you know, a white labeled service back to the end users. Um, and we also have uh, OEMs, you know, router device manufacturers that, that do the same. They'll, they'll use APIs and they are transparently integrating or forwarding traffic to our service in a way that the end user doesn't even see an agent or have anything on their network that's doing the redirect. So yeah, we, we, we do have uh, some of those relationships as well. Uh, I can give you an example. Um, uh, if you heard, of, have you heard of the router Wi-Fi vendor Eero that uh, Amazon yes. purchased? Yeah. Yeah. So if you if you buy Eero Security, their their or Eero Plus offering, uh, the actual internet security filtering and scrubbing is Zscaler. It's just white label mm. Eero, and they're doing that on the back end with APIs and integration. They don't hide it completely, but it's all it's an end user branded experience. It's just you know another tab that shows up in your Eero app on your phone. Interesting, very good information and interesting as well. We're going to switch topics and talk about more in-depth security controls. So what we did, okay. because outbound browsing, it's in a way secure web gateway controls. And we mm -hmm. took the Gardner definition of what they say need to be done in part of security web gateway. And we'll yeah. touch base on some of the ideas. 
And we start with the basic one, URL categorization. How are you guys doing this? How's the categories? If it's your own, if it's OEM by somebody else, what's unique about it? Sure. Um, so it's URL categorization is kind of uh, a commodity now, so to say. It's not not a not a big area that any company differentiates in. Um, we have always done a dual approach where we have our own categorization and our own databases that we've been building over time. If you think about you know 100 million transactions a day now for even just a month, that's that's a lot of categorization, and we've we've invested heavily in machine learning and, and dynamic categorization on the fly. So we've got our own source, and that's that's the primary source, and then. We absolutely OEM from um, from a couple third parties um, that uh, the rest of the industry uses. We we OEM those databases as well to kind of fill the bridge the gap if there's a particular language or region or geo that uh, uh, that we don't have full coverage for. Uh, so we, we do a combination of both uh, just to make sure that that's never uh, you know that's that's kind of table stakes. If you don't have good basic categorization of the internet, you start any everything starts breaking whether you're trying to throttle bandwidth, you know, making a YouTube video stream properly versus prioritizing Office 365 or um, obviously security is is really important. The security categorizations, we uh, we, we take it a step further. We, we have about 60 collectively third party feeds. And these are partnerships that we have with companies like Microsoft's and Google's of the world. Um, they're community driven initiatives, you know, the fish tanks and you know, common community sources of Intel. And then we purchase, you know, a antivirus is another commodity thing. We, you know, we OEM AV databases. We didn't have to, we, we won't try to reinvent the wheel when we don't have to. And so uh, we bring in 60 third party security feeds. Uh, collectively, the security and the URL categorization, one number we're kind of proud of is we, we are updating our intelligence, those, those data sources, a little over 100,000 times a day collectively. Wow. And that's a, you would never see an appliance company try to update an appliance with 100,000 database updates a day. That's only when you have a cloud service can you start churning like that. Do you have your own uh, threat research team? We do. We have a, um, we have a threat, threat research team, um, uh, this counter to the naming scheme. Uh, they're called Threat Labs with a Z at the end, uh, but there's still a Z in there. Um, that's a, they actually have a, a great security blog that's for the industry that's often quoted and referenced a lot. And they're also charged with the security e efficacy of our service and um, doing all the modern tool sets, whether it's, you know, community exchanges with things like sticks and taxi to um, um, analyzing when we see some new emerging threats that no one's seen before publicly disclosing and, and, talking about them with the rest of the community to um, um, Makes sense. running our sandboxing infrastructure. I am a lot of attacks originating from trusted and well-known domains these days. How you block bad or only known URLs dynamically, right? And something can be actually flagged as good yeah. URL, and then it becomes bad. It's weaponized or someone using it like, you know, a, like a G suit and files to, to accommodate like CNC control or anything like that. Yeah. Yeah. So there's like, there's a couple of parts to that. Um, you know, one, one common angle is a, is a newly registered domain, something that was registered, you know, an hour ago and is all of a sudden now serving malware that no, no categorization would have. We, we have policies that allow you to, uh, say, don't allow a user to go to any newly registered domain for that's been registered in the last 30 days. That's actually pretty effective because very very rare will you find legitimate applications that get hurt by that. Um, you get a lot more security by just saying don't allow newly registered domains. Um, so that that's a that's a policy element we've seen very powerful. We also allow customers to do things like if it hasn't been categorized, um, to display a captcha or a caution. Uh, so don't prevent the user from getting there actively, but um, give them a warning that hey, this is could be something pretty suspicious, and so they'll they'll often implement. Captures or things like that. Um, in addition, how about protecting from malicious file downloads? Yeah, so uh, we, we've we've always had the ability to to say file types allow or deny, um, and so commonly, you know, there may be groups of users that should never download an executable, and and that's a common policy. But more commonly now. Um, what we end up doing is our sandboxing capability. You, you basically say, allow the user to download it, but it has to go through the sandbox first. 
And if the cloud has never seen it before, or like, well, let's say they're downloading a file that the cloud has seen before, we, we, we do a checksum hash on any file that's going. If we've seen it before, it can fast path, they can download it right away. If we've never seen it before, uh, you can literally set your policy to say quarantine it. Uh, and it's, it, the end user experience is quite good still. They get a page that says, hey, we're gonna scan this, please wait. And a couple minutes later, then it pops up and says, hey, it's been scanned, it's, and then it's available to download. So we've got that end user workflow uh, pretty nice there. A lot of the other sandbox players had, didn't ever build the quarantine capability because they weren't a full proxy. They were doing it on the network on the side where we can kind of really own that user experience. And that's, I've seen, uh, and that's how Zscaler protects ourselves is uh, everything has to go through the sandbox. How about uh, detecting uh, malicious content? Hosted within the site, right? Many of these uh, malicious uh, actors they planting uh, either Flash-based malware or in some cases uh, JavaScript, which yeah. is you know which coming from you. Do, do you actually as part of the full JavaScript of the site? It's uh, minified, it's uglified. It's, it's hard to distinguish between the good portion of it and the bad portion. Would you be able to separate this and you know uh, only serve the healthy portion of the JavaScript? Yeah. Uh, so short answer is yes. Now that's naturally always going to be a cat and mouse game where they'll come up with new evasive techniques and we'll come up with new countermeasures. And that's always, that's part of what our threat research team does on a daily basis um, is, is keep that up to date. Um, the, where we, I think we shine a little bit is because our heritage as a true proxy, we're a full layer seven proxy. And so we are, you know, actively, proxying that content, not trying to scan it passively like the way a stateful firewall would. Um, so that gives us the ability to detect and unminify or uh, deobfuscate JavaScript and look for zero pixel iframes and do all the kind of, you know, unpacking techniques because we're a full proxy. That gives us a, an advantage there. Um, we also can still send those objects through sandboxing. Um, and the last piece is we, we made a recent investment in um, browser isolation. And that can, I think, be very helpful in, you can, you can write a policy that says when a user is browsing a suspicious website, don't let that content render on the user's browser. Render it on a, you know, a headless browser in the cloud and just stream pixels or images down to the end user's device. So the, it's a totally transparent end user experience, but uh, from a security perspective, a huge win because you know, some, of the, some of the, all those you know, kind of current web threats are, are more isolated and never even going to the endpoint. You see a uh, user say if the site is uncategorized running through browser isolation. This is the main use case I yep. see with a lot of the customers. Yep. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Is uh, people like the idea of browser isolation? It, it, it is a huge win for the company? I think so, without a doubt. As long as it's a modern way of isolating where it's transparent to the end user, where they may not even know it's there. Um, a lot of the early browser isolation technology that we all saw was compromised either with performance or, um, you know, the, the user experience was not great. But, uh, you know, we, we acquired a company almost a year ago called Absolate that had a very modern approach to how to do this. And um, I, I think it's been a huge win. It's, it's interesting. I have a question around that. You know, mo most of the modern applications, they are one, uh, one page applications, right? They're written in Angular or uh, React or anything else. Mm -hmm. How would the browser resolution be able to, to actually handle this type of applications? Because it's actually an application that's executing and interacting with the user in the browser context. And it never goes, you know, it's not never like a request response where you can capture the response and render it as a pixel and send it to the user. Yeah. Would it, would it be able to handle it? It would. Um... The way to think about it, and um, our uh, our engineering leader of the of, of the team is in is in emerging tech, and uh, he, he'll throw something at me if he hears me dumb it down this much. But this is the right way, I think, to kind of think about what it's doing. Um, I'm sure you've done a, a remote desktop connection to a you know a Windows machine, and then launched a browser within that. Um, what's literally happening is browser isolation there. That, that, that content staying rendered locally there. You're just sending mouse clicks and getting image refreshes. A modern browser isolation platform, that's all it's doing. I mean, we're literally running a headless version of Chrome in the cloud and using an optimized protocol to stream mouse clicks and, and screen refreshes. Um, that's the right way to do it. And it's then any application is going to work in that environment. I mean, we literally can have even video. We can stream YouTube through it and it works fine as long as uh, 
you know, that protocol is optimized correctly. It's definitely a very popular, um, I guess, angle that we see companies going to and implementing. Let's talk about yeah. Shadow IT. A lot of okay. the companies suffer from Shadow IT. Originally, it was a CASB functionality, but mm -hmm. I think Shadow IT became mainstream for everyone. Yeah. From what we see, there is a lot, maybe more than thousands of different services, and probably maybe 10% of them IT knows about it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, fundamentally, we, we've, been, we've been playing in the CASB shadow IT space before it was even called those things. We, we called it five, six years ago before those terms were really around. We called it Web 2.0, app discovery and control. Um, fundamentally, when a user is going to the internet, we've always been identifying who the user is, uh, what application they're accessing, and then allowing more granularity around, do you, don't just allow or deny that website or that service, but maybe allow them to go to box and download files, but not upload or, um, you know, pro provide more granular controls on that. That's always been a, a core part of what we do, um, even before it was called that. What we've chosen to also do that I think is, is differentiated, uh, I'll share a screen here, one of the dashboards that, uh, um, that is in our, our, uh, our admin UI is what we call cloud applications. We've got a, uh, a cloud application dashboard here, which is showing shadow IT, all the services that are being used. But we, we, we wanted to take it a step further, not just show that they're there, but allow companies to get an understanding of how risky that is. So we're, we're providing a risk level for the applications. And it's not just us. We didn't want to have just a Zscaler point of view there. So we'll bring in, depending on the partner, which, which uh, service they have, we'll bring in data from, uh, I'll pick on this one, um, uh, Twitter. Everyone, everyone's pretty familiar with Twitter. Here's Microsoft's, we, we have syndicated data from Microsoft's Cloud App Security. Uh, it has more visibility to why they say it's good or bad and different things. We bring in BitGlass, we'll bring in, we, went, we, we actually had partnerships with some of the core CASB players to bring that in into our UI. And then you can write your policies around these this risk levels and understand what applications exist. DLP, DLP is a huge topic that we probably can talk an hour for DLP, but if you only have one minute, describe sure. what you guys do in the DLP space. Yeah. So one minute, I can do that. Um, so we, a big part of DLP to be effective today is to be able to do SSL inspection. I think that's obvious. I, I would predict in less than 18 months, the internet's going to be 100% SSL encrypted. We see some of our customers measure it by 90% or more now. Uh, so because we're a full proxy, uh, we can, we're not blind to any SSL transaction. That's really, that's table stakes for DLP. When we're inspecting SSL, like a user going to Gmail, uploading an attachment, uh, we have out of the box predefined dictionaries or engines. Um, I can I can share that on a screen. Um, so we've got out of the box engines that you can use in a few clicks, and you can say, um, I want to look for credit card numbers as a particular engine. So we've got these predefined dictionaries here, uh, like uh, look for adult content or credit card numbers or financial statements or gambling or these are all predefined dictionaries. You can just in two clicks apply and say. When a user tries to post credit card numbers to anything, block it, alert it, log it, allow it to go through, but send an, an audit trail back to auditors. Uh, this is kind of basic forms of DLP that is really powerful, again, when you're not blind to SSL. We added um, in the last few years, I'd say really advanced DLP functionality uh, that our customers asked us to do, which is doing a, what's called exact data match technology. I don't know if you're familiar with EDM, mm -hmm. but EDM basically allows we give what's called an indexer, a VM that a customer can run on their prem in their network. It can connect to their exact data sources, so their file shares, their database mounts, et cetera. And we never wanted liability as a third party of storing their data or even having visibility to it. No matter what a third party would say, I would never trust a third party with certain you know, pieces of data in my organization. So what we do is we do a one-way cryptographic hash of what that content is. So if it's a bank account number, we're going to do a one-way cryptographic hash and just send that hash to our cloud. And then as a user is browsing the web, going to doing whatever they're doing, we can apply in real time that exact same algorithm to hash whatever content they have. And if it matches, then we have an exact data match and we can block that from leaving the organization. Um, and so we've seen 
um, you know, that was developed initially for a large financial customer where they said, you know, we've got, we've got hundreds of millions of accounts and billions of other data points. And we want to exactly identify if this is ever leaking out to the internet, but we can't trust you with having visibility to it. And uh, our EDM capability in DLP is really differentiated because you cannot even think about touching half of what we're doing there unless you have a true multi-tenant elastic, you know, set of cloud infrastructure to be able to deliver it. Yeah. Makes sense. So this brings us to, to the question of uh, if I'm a customer and I want to POC your solution, how would I do that? Yeah, so there's uh, we, we do POCs in a couple different ways. We, we have you know, pre-canned environments that are already pre-configured that, that's shared that they can start playing with very quickly. Or we do have, we, we absolutely encourage you know, full POCs where we provision you just a normal tenant on our cloud in minutes not because again, we're not dedicating or spinning up infrastructure. You can have an account in a few minutes and um, then you can go through um, configuring the whole service. And if the POC is successful, that's your production tenant. Then you can convert it to production. Uh, you know, there's nothing to convert other than adding a license to entitle it. Uh, so POCs are very, very commonly done. That's what it should be in the cloud world. Great. We spoke about multiple vendors uh, that you guys partner with. Oh, I mentioned BitGlass, uh, Microsoft, some other one. Can you name maybe yeah. some other technical partnerships that uh, are helping you and helping the industry in general? Yeah, yeah. and I, I actually do have, um, I, I have a slide. Now these logos that are on here are not all inclusive. They're just representative of some of the vendors. Uh, but we kind of view the, the, the partnership space uh, in a few buckets. And I think this is also important because we're, we're doing a lot. We, you know, we're tackling a lot of, um, different areas with just what we do ourselves, but we're not trying to be all things to all people. Um, and this is how this has guided our product development as well, meaning areas that we choose deliberately not to go into, uh, cause no one can be, you know, a, we don't want to ever be in the category of a Jack of all trades mastering nothing. So think of us as the inline security policy enforcement for anything coming in and out. Um, we've deliberately partnered and created all these dotted lines or APIs, um, I, I mentioned before, we consume identity from whatever they have. That's standard SAML-based integrations, mm -hmm. but also more modern implementations like Skim, uh, where we can do real-time attribute syncing. And if a user is deprovisioned, they get kicked off our service immediately. And we use Skim as a protocol to keep that current. So we've invested heavily in those uh, APIs. On the so you can left, tell CrowdStrike, Carbon Black, Mobile Iron to kick somebody off the network based on XYZ. Yeah, the bottom left, the endpoint protection, that's where you got the EDR players like Cloud Strikes and Carbon Blacks. Uh, that can be policy integration, but that also is telemetry. So if um, you know we detect a threat that CrowdStrike needs Intel on or vice versa, you can actually uh, integrate so that the two, you know, your CrowdStrike tenant is sharing um, indicators of compromise with your Zscaler tenant and vice versa. We've got APIs between those players. Um, the NDMs on the bottom left, you know, the air watches or Intunes or mobile irons of the world, they often can be used to deploy our app. And so we've got API integrations with all of them. The bottom right, we already covered the branch devices, whether it's routers or more commonly SD-WAN devices, having APIs to ease traffic forwarding and orchestration. And then we also did cover the top right, which is this, the SOC SIM vendors, the Splunk's arc sites, curators of the world. Um, those, those have, we have API integrations so that we can stream events out to them. Um, so this is just a, kind of a macro view of the, of the platform. We, I saw you had some questions around other things like SOAR, DLP, EDR, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, we, we also have, uh, if, I, if, I, if I try to logo you to death, um, we've got integrations available and in dev and future. I guess it's all gonna be fine on your, on your website. Wow, yes, I love that. Yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a very sensitive list, definitely. So, <laughs> yeah. the, and, 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 that's, and that's great. It looks like you can integrate with uh, many players in the market, but you know what, what it brings us to is, and uh, I think it ties to some report that you already showed us. What are the three reports or metrics that can show you know the state before and after I start using your product, and also maybe what would be the metric, what would be the you know the result I would show as a CISO to the board? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that, uh, if, if you recall, I can share it here in a moment. The, the risk yeah. dashboard is 
I really like the comparison market. to the rest of the market. I think that's that's a powerful metric that you have, right? But is yeah. there anything else, right? More, more deeper, more interesting that you can show us? Yeah. So when you talk about, um, you know, a sea level report, we even the, the the screens that I've been sharing with you are kind of the IT admins going into the console. We summarize. Um, let me let me uh, let me share my screen here. We summarize this data when you're, when you're talking about getting into like sea level reporting back on what's happening. We, we, we have an, a mobile app that is called Exec Insights that literally as a IT admin, I can go create a sea level account and give them a login to this data in their iPhone or their you know tablet. And they get a very high level, even further summarized view of this data um, that they can access in real time, even if need be. And so we'll see CISOs use that to do board presentations and so forth. Um, we also, you'll see here, we've got this, this bucket called executive reports. And this is kind of a one page report that you can configure to you know, email or send off to a, a group of execs in the company that kind of mm. provide an overall summary. How many threats did we block in the last month? Overall security versus policy violations, what your percentages versus the cloud average, of the things that we blocked, what were some of the advanced things that we saw? So you'll see, you know, crypto mining, spyware phishing, et cetera. We saw 198 phone home botnets. Usually that's always a metric that they, that they care about. What value did the sandbox deliver? Um, so this is kind of a very high level. This is a one page report that, and it pivots beyond just security. It shows like where internet activity is going or, um, you know, what's consuming the most bandwidth or what business applications are there, et cetera. So we have these exec report, uh, that is often used for that as well. Great. There's one question I forgot to ask uh, when we spoke about secure obligatory is the idea of bandwidth sure. control. And you mentioned about okay. YouTube as well. So were they able yeah. to, in a way, control my bandwidth, limit my bandwidth? You are. And we again exploit the fact that because we're a full proxy, uh, we can do very uh, good bandwidth optimization. And by that, I mean, we're not a network device that's going to have a packet queue and then start dropping packets and then causing, um, um, you know, an end user to experience interruption. You, you see that when, when network devices try to do aggressive bandwidth throttling. Uh, because we're a proxy, we can do things gracefully like control TCP window sizes, shrinking them up and down on one side or the other. And so like when, when I'll, I'll share a screen here, when you write a policy that says streaming media shouldn't take more than 20% of my pipe, um, what we do is a YouTube video, rather than streaming at a high def, we'll stream at standard def when there's times of contention. And you'll never see a frame interrupted. Preserving bandwidth, only when you're a full TCP proxy can you do it that gracefully or selectively. Um, and so that is just another element in your policy that you don't have to worry about how to classify traffic or you know, how to get in line to the traffic on the side or things like that. Our, our bandwidth policies are really this simple streaming media, what, what, here, if I show you the bandwidth classes, you can say, um, what kinds of things, is it file shares, is it streaming media, is it VoIP, is it web conferencing? Uh, and you can either then start saying guarantee minimum bandwidth, maximum bandwidth, and these numbers then apply dynamically to whatever bandwidth values are set on the locations that you're applying the policies to. That and this sense. will work for offices and the ZIA? Uh, this... In in uh, in full transparency, does not work for ZApp today yet. Okay. So that's that's coming. This is uh, this is for fixed locations uh, sure. today, but won't be the case very soon. Awesome. So we are done with our official uh, part of the show, and we're moving okay. to more open discussion, open topics. I do have a few questions, and I know we kind of a bit limited on time. Before I have sure. few questions, is there anything else you would like to mention about Zscaler that we didn't even touch today on the show? I don't think so. I think you, you've, you've covered a lot with your questions. Um, Great. I'm just checking uh, my notes. I don't, nothing comes to mind. I'm happy to tackle your questions. Awesome. So number one is you mentioned when people move to work from home, the traffic spikes. Do you know yeah. what's the average bandwidth from a user? I'm wondering. Yeah, that varies dramatically based on region. Um, North America, Western Europe will, will be much higher than Central Latin, South America, and a, um, parts of that. It varies dramatically. 
I think one of the macro numbers that um, that we we look at is um, just how much bandwidth sustained is off. If you divide it over twenty four seven, you know we we see a hundred to a couple hundred kilobits of bandwidth per user sustained. If you do it over an even time period, now naturally that'll be very bursty because they're going to be doing an hour of work and just email, and then all of a sudden stream a Netflix video, and that'll be very different depending on that activity. Um, but um, you know, you're usually talking definitely uh, sustained less than less than a megabit consumed uh, per second if you average it over time. So you mentioned Netflix, and we, we spoke about uh, Zoom as well. Why would I yeah. run Zoom on Netflix through Zscaler? Why don't just let it pass directly? Yeah, so you could on your policy say at even at the ZF level, let it go direct. Uh, the reasons why you would commonly still go through Zscaler. Um, there's, there's probably three parts to that question. Uh, the first reason is if you still want to have visibility reporting analytics where bandwidth is going. Now, if it's users home, then you may not care about that. Um, uh, but if you do want visibility to the reporting metrics analytics, um, then uh, it needs to go through us obviously to generate that. Um, the second reason is uh, from bandwidth optimization to, to the last question. Uh, if you do want us to preserve bandwidth for O365 over Netflix, it has to go through us for us to apply the bandwidth policies. Uh, and then the third reason is, um, from a security perspective, even though those are even though those are considered trusted destinations, uh, you still may want us there in case they ever did get compromised, or uh, you know, a broader use case. Maybe Netflix and Zoom are not as good. Well, actually, Zoom from a data loss prevention, you can attach files to a Zoom meeting if you want. If you want DLP on that, um, you know, there's still benefit or merit to add there. Uh, but also, if it's you know let's say it's Microsoft, Google Drive, you know, lots of malware hosted on Google Drive. A lot, of, a lot of security companies say, oh, Google, that's a trusted destination bypass. Uh, we will never say that on our side because, again, the reality is, um, you know, there is bad content that gets hosted there. I have a question about TLS 1.3. What's your personal okay. take on this and what do you think will change in the industry or with this scaler? Yeah. So... Because of our heritage as a proxy, uh, it's a non-event for us um, because the way we do SSL inspection is not done using the, the, so what's changing in the industry is there's a lot of third party devices or things attached on the side of a network on a span or tap port that was trying to inspect encrypted traffic. And they were doing so um, because things like PFS wasn't required to be enabled in TLS prior to 1.3. Um, whereas now it's absolutely required. You can't, 1.3 requires PFS. And so that breaks their ability and how they were doing SSL inspection in the past. Um, because we're a proxy and we're not doing it that way, it's a non-event for us. I think it's just going to further um, uh, require the need for proxies to, to be in play uh, to handle 1.3 encrypted traffic because that's where the world is going. It's going to be 100% very soon. Um, if not, um, it already isn't in many networks already. Um, so I think it's just going to further, it's going to, we already have seen malware shift when they try to exfiltrate data or when they're doing command and control to do so within TLS uh, because they know that so many of the networks are blind to it. And, uh, you know, with, with 1.3, ways that companies were looking at TLS are going to break or not work anymore. And it's, I think it's just going to accelerate that curve. I have a question in regards to that. In order, you, you're decrypting TLS traffic, right? Yeah. And uh, so, so it's, you need to place some certificate of your own on the on the device. Correct. Now, there's of course you know the default ways of doing that. Correct. And then you know applications that kind of playing well with the ecosystem would use it. However, mm -hmm. if I'm a malicious attacker, I wouldn't care about playing the rules right i would bring my own authority and i would have my full own decrypted tunnel how would you go around that yeah so one of our policy elements is if we cannot decrypt the traffic do you want to allow or deny it and so that could categorically block that um, now you can break other protocols there's there's pins pinning yeah. of things and you, you you'll maintain a bypass list uh for that but uh uh, that's the first policy element that helps in that equation. Uh, the second one is um, 
the I wanted to I wanted to emphasize you don't have to deploy our cert on the endpoint. We can actually leverage your existing certs if the company is mature enough. They have existing PKI schemes or frameworks. We actually have um, the ability for a customer to basically bring their own cert to our service. They they basically create us as an intermediary off of their existing PKI mm -hmm. scheme. They can make that be very short lived to mitigate the risks with us. And we have APIs that allows them to rotate that. And we'll basically dynamically deliver certs to their users with their in their chain, not just with our cert, which is how we've been able to deploy SSL for large, large organizations uh, where you, you don't even maybe want the risk of trusting a generic Zscaler cert for all your users. Uh, so that helps with that equation a little bit. And then last but not least, obviously we're a policy engine. So it's up to the customer to say, do I do SSL decryption all the time? Do I do it only for these categories of sites? Do I not do it when a user is roaming in China and do it when they're in the States or, you know, all the different policy elements that you would think are, are uh, need, needed are there in our, in our engine. Make a lot of sense. Thank you. Thank you. Patrick, any questions to us? No, thank you very much. I enjoyed, uh, enjoyed our time. Thank you. Before we end the show, uh, if people want to find more information, we will, of course, in, put a description in the podcast. But anything you want to add, or maybe email us later on the information how they can find more information about the EOC and about the product. Another piece of information that I think would be interesting to put as part of, of the publishing for the podcast is uh, the link to the thread research team of yours. Sure. That, that mm -hmm. would be very interesting. Yeah, I'll, I'll make sure we get that to you. And feel free if you wanted to, I don't know if you guys collaborate on Twitter or have discussions or anything, I'm, I'm very active. So um, feel free to share any contact. I'll make sure we include that too. Of course, we'll follow you. In. Awesome. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you guys. Nice to meet you. Please remember to subscribe to our podcast and join us for our next episode.